where we started, which was in 2021. And as the International Resources Panel under the leadership of Yanis and Isabella, we thought it was important to look at biodiversity loss through the lens of natural resource use. And by that, we mean how can countries implement their obligations under the CBD, but more importantly, going forward, um, Troiti, as you know, the new global biodiversity framework, how can countries meet their obligations or their voluntary efforts to fix their issues around biodiversity loss. And the piece, and I hope people have seen that, um, that was co-authored by Yanis and Isabella, our co-chairs, where they highlighted the role of natural resources to achieve biodiversity outcomes. Um, we've circulated that quite widely. We've received positive feedback from many quarters. Um, we had um, Akim and from UNDP and we had UNEP and we had Joyti and we had a lot of other NGOs who joined us in 2021 to look at this issue of how can we look at managing biodiversity loss, but look at it through a natural resource lens. Bob, you've been very instrumental, pardon me, in this particular effort. And Joyti, I know you're gonna have to leave very shortly. Um, so we may have to give you the floor um, earlier rather than later. Isabella, once she's online, she was going to tell us a little bit about the science. Yanis? Isabella is connected, just for you to know. I'm sorry to interrupt. Fantastic, great. And Yanis will then also talk about governance issues, which is absolutely important, but as we know, very, very, very difficult. Um, but if there's anybody who can deal with that difficulty, it's, it's Yadis. And Joyti, you will try to tell us what you think we as the RFP, but also the broader community can do to support your efforts in the CBD. And then Bob will also give his um, reflections. Isabella, are you ready? Can I give Hello, you Mary the floor? Lee, can you hear me? I can. Oh, thank you very much. I used to be always ready, <laughs> but uh, I'm sorry because I'm later. We have a technological difficulty to connect here. Mm -hmm. So I'm very honored to and uh, very delighted to join you today in our friends. And I'd like to share uh, some uh, ideas or some perspectives considering uh, the four natural resource management principles for biodiversity governance, as we proposed, Yanis and I, in our think piece. So, uh, as Mary stated in her introduction, natural resource use in the major driver of biodiversity loss. We, uh, our international resource panel data powerfully show this, telling us that uh, extraction and processing of resources responsible for more than 9% of global biodiversity loss. Extraction of biomass alone accounts for 8%. So when looking at these numbers, it's impossible to see how you can tackle biodiversity uh, loss without improving our natural resource management. Last year, as I mentioned before, INSI published its end opinion piece and the building biodiversity, also based in our 
political experience, if I can say this, since Nagoya Protocol negotiation, and how pragmatic it used to be uh, and to move forward. So, uh, based on this, we have the principles that guide us. We have four principles, know your impact, planning together, growing with nature, and value nature. And I will talk through them. I will ask the secretariat to share the, the slide that, uh, that uh, we propose to facilitate our understanding here. So we start with knowing your impact on nature. We can also call this value chain transparency, showing the impacts of natural resource use at every stage of our product life cycle from extraction of the materials to the end use. Uh, tell you how your consumption impacts nature. It means the ability to directly connect the consumers to driven action. For example, in the cough in your cup, link it to easier, it's the cough in your cup, link it to the free station. How much more resource intensive is the meat on your plate than an alternative protein, such as humans or a plant based burger? By knowing the impacts, consumers, producers, investors, and policymakers will be able to choose sustainable, nature positive models and scale them up in every step of the value chains. Technology is a way to helping companies to know how they impact. For example, satellites are being used to trace the origin of cocoa in some progressive chocolate supply chains. So progress is encouraging, but for value chain transparency to be a reality, we need strong scientific data and consistent international standard. So the next principle is planning together, balancing the needs of nature and people in the space available. This is particular interest for me here in Brazil. It means be together in planning a better future. Countries are missing the full picture of how their natural resources are being used. What is needed is an integrated stretch showing the special and the resource needs of nature and people. Without an integrated strategy, conflicting demands will not be balanced. For example, we should, where should we grow forests? which land is better suitable for which crops and which land is really indispensable for urbanization. Having such a strategy that integrates all future biomass and land needs means that the decision makers can better conserve biodiversity at the same time as meeting human needs. At COP15, Policymakers should commit to science based on mapping on biodiversity and natural resource use. This would enable competing demands to be met with the space available. The third principle is growing with nature. This is fantastic, it's fascinating, and so difficult. Production can be more sustainable through harnessing nature with human and regenerative capacity. What does that mean? It's very simple terms. It can be reducing chemical fertilizer and encouraging natural soil process or generating value from natural products. Harnessing these nature-based and circular solutions has many benefits, like generating landscapes and minimize waste and also impacts. At CBD, COP15, policymakers should incentivize production with enhanced nature by redirection financial support to regenerative agriculture and commodity production, which goes hand in hand with the solicitation. Working with producers to scale these solutions should be a priority. I had this experience in my country in Brazil, and I know how we have the right direction but how the complex this political action is. Finally, let me turn to the principle of value nature. As mentioned earlier, economic systems 
have failed to recognize our dependence on nature. This failure is contributing to the mismanagement of natural resource use. The Dasgupta review makes the case of changing what we mean by economic success. Economic decisions could be based on an inclusive measure of wealth, factoring human, produce, and natural capital. This would enable government to recognize the importance of existence in all their decisions. Leaders need to agree a way forward on recognizing nature and economic decision making. Decision making, sorry. This could be by exploring new measures of economic success beyond GDP. Incentives need to change so that to make economic sense, not to destroy the bad forces we'll all rely on. So I think that these principles are really important. Uh, to guide us and also to to guide out the actions to action to act to act but also to address better our ambition when you connect uh, Stockholm complex 50 climate agenda and also biodiversity post 2020 platform thank you very much i will hand over to Yanis to talk in more detail about concrete actions to personalize these principles thank you very much Yanis, you have the screen Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Isabella. Dear friends of the biodiversity and of the beauty of the wonders of life, I want to highlight how targets in the proposed global biodiversity framework are already capturing natural resource management principles, which is a major step forward and give us also the hope. However, the post-2020 framework is not yet clear on how it will guide or facilitate science-based implementation. Based on the IRP science that Isabella has presented and based on the high level roundtable we had at the end of last year, I'd like to suggest some concrete actions towards effective implementation, which multiple actors can take forward this year. Starting with the first principle, knowing your impact. Several targets in the draft global biodiversity framework already highlight the importance of knowing your true impact, like targets number five, seven, nine, and 16. They cover the need for sustainable and legal trade, sustainable waste management, and pollution reduction and responsible consumption, all of which rely on science-based value chain transparency. For effective implementation, national reporting will need to be upscaled. No current national biodiversity strategy or action plan explicitly mentions supply value chain transparency or even supply value chain impact. And concretely, there are no concrete methods for coherent science-based reporting on a global basis. All actors have roles to play in moving towards international agreement on standardized transparency on impact through, uh, throughout the value chains. So what can we do concretely this year? At COP15, ambitious countries can take leadership by committing to developing an agreed, science-based, standardized method for measuring the impact of consumption on biodiversity, acknowledging that COP15 will only be, of course, part of the journey. As a first step, UNEP or CBD could bring together scientific experts and national government policymakers to work towards the needed scientifically robust user-friendly method for measuring the impact of national consumption on biodiversity. Business and finance should express their need for aligned standards and methods and their willingness to support transparency with the help of good standards and ideally as simple as possible tools. Moving now to the second principle, planning together, integrated spatial planning. Spatial planning is captured by several targets in the draft global biodiversity framework. For example, the first target aims to ensure all land and sea areas globally are under integrated biodiversity inclusive spatial planning. Brilliant to see this expressed so explicitly. Another key target for the next global biodiversity framework is the aim of conserving 30% of land and sea for biodiversity by 2030. Let's be clear that conserving this area is absolutely crucial. 
but not enough in its own. Every area, even if it's used for agriculture or infrastructure building, must be managed to be nature positive as possible. Integrated spatial planning will be crucial to achieve this. Conservation areas and best management of all areas while minimizing trade-offs as much as possible. Spatial planning must be part of national planning on biodiversity and uh, rely anything that relates to land use. However, only 15% of the national biodiversity strategy action plans currently include spatial information for guiding action. So there is a real room and need for improvement here. As with the other principles, internationally agreed standards are essential to ensure that decisions are based on top quality evidence and countries can understand each other's practices. So what could, could we do concretely in 2022? At CBD COP15, again, key governance and science players, including UNEP, CBD, IPBS, and potentially UNDP, could jointly commit to developing internationally agreed mapping standards based on the best possible science and to build capacity to implement inclusive spatial planning as widely as possible. This could be initiated by bringing together ambitious governments and technical and implementation experts in a standing group, working towards science-based mapping standards and comprehensive user-friendly tools. This group would build on existing best practice, examples such as Nature Map and UN science bodies like IPBS and also our IRP. The third principle is growing with nature. The importance of productive sectors in biodiversity solutions are captured in draft CBD targets. Targets are aimed to ensure livelihoods through sustainable management of species and natural resources and enhance the benefits that nature delivers to people, including regulation of air and water quality. Food production accounts for significant uses of terrestrial and marine biodiversity, so changes in this sector will be key to achieving targets. Agriculture, or to be more precise, food system, must become central to biodiversity solutions, just as the energy sector has become central to climate action. Again, what could we concretely do this year? To progress on implementing nature positive production, CBT COP15 can commit to developing a set of science based criteria for nature positively giving much needed clarity to governments, producers, and investors. As a first step towards this, at CBD COP15, UNEP, together with sponsoring governments, could host a space for the scientific community to showcase best methods for demonstrating nature positivity in production and leading producers to demonstrate inspiring examples of nature positive value creation. Now, finally, our final fourth principle, valuing nature. Valuing nature means accounting for its benefits. Now, we are aware this can be a contagious item. Some argue that you cannot really put a price on nature because the intrinsic value of life is greater than any monetary price and shouldn't be for sale. And by the way, they are right. But as long as markets will guide our lives and decisions, not valuing nature just leads to disrespecting this intrinsic value of life and nature. It leads to its depletion and accelerates exploitation beyond any reasonable limits, ending, of course, outside planetary boundaries. As Isabella said, economic decision makers need to factor nature into their choices and shift economic incentives. And the draft CBD targets acknowledge this quite well. Several draft CBD targets state the need to incorporate the value of nature into decision making at all levels. Seven draft targets are captured under the category of tools and solutions for mainstreaming. They include the need to redirect financial flows away from harmful activities and towards the conservation and sustainable use of nature. So 
what else can be done at and beyond also COP15 to further implement the value nature principle. At COP15, institutions including CBD, UNEP, UNDP and World Bank should commit to working together towards the establishment of a minimum standard for natural capital accounting data. They could also collaborate for a joint capacity building initiative with countries on natural capital measurement and inclusion of nature in decision making. Protecting nature simply matters and we humans should start behaving as being part of nature and not external to it. Finally, I would just like to highlight that these principles are not just another complicated layer of regulations and matrix. Ultimately, all principles together can actually enable innovative, innovative investment solutions and really bring cooperation to the next level beyond just negotiating targets. For example, more and more large food retailers are interested in strategically investing into nature positive supply. But how can they do that without good standards, clear matrix for measuring the impact of their supply chains and without good overview of where they can find regenerative models to invest in. But with integrated spatial planning advancing, value chain transparency advancing, regenerative agriculture being defined and mapped well and clear valuing of ecosystem services, we can really come up with some with mainstream investment strategies. And one important uh, I would like to uh, one important thing I would in particular like to underline being many years in policy making, we do not have to wait until perfect standards exist and have this as an excuse not to act. We can already test new cross-border investment models. Governments and private finance, finances can, for example, create blended funds to enhance natural capital through investing in nature positive production without any delay. A key characteristic of this kind of fund would be that it would finance alternatives to practices which harm nature. It could provide startup capital for producers to diversify their revenue streams while also benefiting retailers in having access to, sub to sustainable supply that it's growing uh, in, in the growing consumer's demand. So dear friends, we are all repeating the message of urgency and also that there is no more time to lose. For if we are honest, for quite some years already now. All this repetition, as noble and sincere as it is, it's becoming more or less part of the same lost time we are trying to fight against with the measures we share. In short, it is time to stop calling for change. It is time to stop waiting for the others. It is time to show a real leadership. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yanis. Um, you've actually, and also Isabella, just for our colleagues who might want to pose questions in the chat. So Isabella, you start by saying, we need to go beyond GDP as a measure of how well we're doing. You also said that natural biodiversity needs to focus on supply value chain um, impact. You spoke about sustainable legal trade issues. Yanis, you just taking your last point, um, basically, this is my words, um, made the point that we depend on natural resources and biodiversity. Um, but you also said that in terms of understanding um, the governance mechanism, you, I think, if I understood correctly, you said we need to develop certain standards. Um, we need to understand how those standards help us to quote unquote grow with nature. And then 
you mentioned, you know, the four principles that's outlaid in your um, piece, which I'm not going to go on about. And then you also made very strong point about valuing nature. And I think what I took away from you is you said the energy system it has been understood in a particular way by the climate community. And we need to do the same with our nature based system or our natural resources system. Um, and my sense is that we're not quite there yet, but hopefully we will be there. I know any chats in the box before I continue. Not currently, so I think we can continue with. No? Tia. Okay. No. Okay, good. Thanks, Anoa. So we can continue with, pardon me. Um, so let's go to Joyti. Joyti, I know you have to leave. Sorry to keep you, but welcome. Thanks so much, Merlin, and thank you so much for inviting uh, the CBD to be part of this uh, panel and the work that you're doing, especially on biodiversity loss. Um, I am, th I am very, it's, it's very frightening to follow Isabella and Yannick, but I will try and do my best. Um, it also was very heartening to hear some of the uh, some of the points that were made by them. Uh, we totally agree that we need to go beyond GDP. In fact, I think we should scrap the whole GDP system and find something new. But that's beyond the GBF to do. But you know, maybe uh, if we can start a conversation around that, it could happen soon. I also was very, very pleased to hear from uh, Yanni that um, a lot of our targets actually um, uh, are, uh, you know, address uh, the uh, natural resource principles. Um, but I also heard what he said about um, science from implementation might be science for implementation and from for reporting on implementation may be missing. So I um, wanted to add that um, we are actually building a monitoring framework with headline indicators with the um, with the GBF at the same time, and that is a way for us to uh, capture implementation using science. And we hope that this will be agreed at the same time as the framework and adopted at the same time, so that we don't have five years later or six years later, and people are well into defining or updating their NBSAPs, which I believe uh, will um, may not be fully um, redone, but at least parts of uh, parts of uh, the action plans may be redone to, um, you know, to um, complement what is agreed in the GBF. We also um, hope that it will, we will have a very robust review and reporting and monitoring system, which is another decision that is going to be, um, you know, done at the same time as the GBF. So we hope that these, um, you know, in IT target, there were a lot of places that we found there were gaps which did not support implementation, and we hope that uh, implementation therefore could be supported through these various um, decisions that will come at the same time as um, as the GBF. So GBF is a framework for all. It is a 30-year framework, and but it will be supported by many other decisions that hope to fill the gap that um, we found and learned from implementation at IG. So, um, now to actually talk about what I was supposed to talk about, um, I think, um, well, you know, we've been working tirelessly. The parties to our convention have been working tirelessly in the last two years to um, 
conclude our negotiations, but because of the pandemic, we haven't been able to meet. And now two years later, later two years literally from Rome, uh, we will be meeting in Geneva ne uh, next, well, in a week and a half, where we will uh, continue with the se resumed sessions of our two sub subsidiary bodies and the working group. Um, and these meetings will be an opportunity for in-depth negotiation. So we haven't negotiated the last two years. We've been listening to all the challenges and ambition and what uh, country, uh, what parties and stakeholders want, but we haven't gone into a in-person negotiation. So we will have a in-person negotiation soon, and hopefully this will put us in the right path in for COP15 that should take place later this year, and then we start early implementation. We have been working with GEF, which is our the operating entity of our financial mechanism, UNEP, UNDP, World Bank, uh, and FAO to start uh, early action uh, projects already for, uh, especially for NBSAPs. Um, or at least updating NBSAPs, having action plans, and um, very much like Biofin, having financing plans for implementing uh, their national biodiversity actions and strategies. As you know, we have been having unprecedented support to the post 2020, we had the biodiversity summit. We at, at COP26, there was world leaders were pledging and making very ambitious commitments. We've had NGOs, philanthropies, civil society. I believe in the last year, we had $10 billion that have been pledged for 30 by 30. And so I think we are on the path to to early implementation as soon as the uh, as um, the the GBF is uh, has been adopted i believe we should be able to um, start very well and fast we understand and amongst our parties and our stakeholders there's also a gr growing understanding about the need for science based knowledge and the principles like what you are developing that can support the needed transitions that we must we must accomplish otherwise we're not going to reverse biodiversity loss we will not be able to halt it we will not be able to go towards a regenerative economy so i think that this is something that is um is resonating well within our parties and stakeholders um and the extensive work that has been developed by the International Resource Panel on Natural, Natural Resource Management and the principles um, can very well support poly, policy makers in designing their policies at national level and, and the implementation of the post-2020 framework once it's adopted. Um, from knowing the true impacts and involving private sector and global value chains, as uh, both of uh, the previous speakers said uh, in their work, and these principles can enhance transparency, accountability, and data availability. And this speaks directly to some of the targets, as has already been said. The principles also support integrated spatial planning, as was said, and this can help across government, economic sectors, and stakeholders, which can be a very, very powerful tool for protecting ocean and land habitats, but also resonates with the current discussions under the long term strategic approach on mainstreaming. And now the mainstreaming, uh, the mainstreaming uh, uh, decision is also one that will be um, that will be adopted at the same time as the GPF uh, to help the implementation and move um, us forward towards uh, implementation. So during the negotiations in Geneva, it will be critical to bring different stakeholders into the discussion and we hope that you will be able to come and uh, help um, to provide um, to provide the knowledge and information and tools um, for a more di diverse and transparent process 
we need the best people in the in the room to help identify solutions and you are the best so hopefully you can come and help us craft the framework uh, and this will be a framework for all all of society all of government and um, and so we hope that in the long run implementation will be much easier and uh, much more effective than wh what happened at IT because this is one of the things the post 2020 co chairs are very, very uh, clear about that it must. Uh, with the framework must take a whole of government and whole of society approach so that everybody can see themselves in the framework. And so the standards that you were talking about for supply chains and for private sector, they can come out of the framework, and but we do need help in developing them. COP15, mm. mm. we hope, will be a momentous opportunity to demonstrate to the global community how curbing the loss of biodiversity is everyone's business mm. and to send a strong message of the need to do better, to move away from business as usual and to chart a new path for our planet and our people. So I will leave it here, but mm. we are very, very happy that everyone is, um, is now involved and is helping us build a strong community um, for the implementation of the framework once it's adopted. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you to you, Joyti. And I'm going to put it in simple terms and I'm going to ask you a question. Biodiversity loss matters to everybody. <laughs> and it's an issue that has plagued all of us. Your grandparents, my grandparents, Yanis's grandparents, we can go generations. And we know that it's linked to economics, it's linked to policy, it's linked to transboundary issues, it's very complicated. Which is why as the IRP, we're trying to get a handle on this. Like, how do you get people to take this issue seriously? Governance, big, big, big issue, almost intractable. But, you know, Yanis and Isabella, they, um, our soldiers and they take the issue head on. Um, but also the monitoring framework that you mentioned, Joy, Joy T, and before I hand over to other colleagues, can you tell us a little bit more about what you expect this year in terms of this monitoring framework? I just, I can only imagine it's going to be hard. Very hard mm. and um, the the monitoring framework is something that is being negotiated in Geneva under our science um, substa, our science and technology body and technological advice body. And so um, it, it was a very tough discussion, not negotiation on during the online meetings. Um, and now in the face to face, I think it's going to be very, very uh, tough because uh, countries are, first of all, we wanted to do it differently. We don't want, we want parties now if they are, if they agree to, to um, report to headline indicators. Uh, in the last decade, they have been reporting at, you know, uh, their national, uh, on their national indicators and there's been no global indicator for anything. And so it's basically oranges and apples that we at the Secretariat mm. try to put together for our global biodiversity outlook and you know it's and no one gets a real feel for it during the decade. But mm. now we want to make sure that you know our countries and hopefully they will accept this headline indicator um uh, way of doing um you know way of reporting because then at least we will have we, they're reporting on orange everyone's reporting on oranges and not apples and oranges and the secretariat is not left to um you know bring it all together and then you know we are always uh, struggling to come up with some kind of um uh, you know uh, implementation status which is very exactly. difficult and and the other thing is we're not developing 
the headline indicators. The headline indicators exist. They exist for CITES. They exist, you know, uh, in Correct. CMS. They exist in yeah. UNFCCC. They exist with the forest people. They exist in SDGs. So we will just put them together against our targets. And so countries don't have to develop new indicators and new uh, uh, have the burden of uh, reporting three, four times, they will just report once um, to CITES and to us, to, you know, CMS and to us and to, you know, on those uh, indi on those headline indicators. So we hope that it, it's not going to be an easy discussion. I am anticipating very late nights in Geneva for that. And most of the monitoring framework discussions are in the evening session, the late night session, so they can go on long. But um, hopefully we will come up with a very, very good framework uh, at the end of it. Thank you. And apologies thanks. again for having to leave early. No problem, but thanks for that clarification. I think you um, summed it up well. And if you have to leave, we will um, say to you bon voyage, wherever you're going. Uh, Bob Watson, you are up. Thanks Next. so much. Thanks, Joyce. Bob, Bob Watson is apparently retired, but he keeps on coming back. Bob? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, as we've heard from the previous speakers, we need to know the impact of what we do, plan together. We need to grow with nature and we need to value nature. Now, who are the key actors? Well, it's been mentioned by each of the speakers the scientific community, government national, subnational, international organizations, business finance, NGOs, and indigenous people and local community. We need all of them to work together. This is not an issue for just one set of actors. So what do we need? Well, we first need all of the actors to understand the principles. Then we need them to embrace the principles, and then we need them to implement the principles. Now, the one point I'll make first is these are not just principles for biodiversity. They're equally important for climate change, land degradation and pollution. If I think of climate change, we need to know the impact of fossil fuels, renewable energy, hydropower, bioenergy, nuclear power. We need to plan together. We need to know what is the land available for food, for water, for bioenergy, a key issue, and hydropower, a key issue for climate change. Need to grow for nature, just like for the biodiversity issue. We need sustainable production of agriculture, fisheries, uh, forestry, etc. And valuing nature is central, not only to biodiversity, but our whole economic system. So how do we actually work with these various uh, players? Well, the scientific community, there's really three. The funding agencies for research nationally and internationally. So we first have to start to make sure the funding agencies understand these four principles. They understand what knowledge needs to be generated to implement. We need the scientific community at the national and international level. And so Future Earth, which is an international program of both natural scientists and social scientists, we need to get in contact with Future Earth, work with Future Earth to make sure that the knowledge that's needed will indeed be developed for implementation. And of course, we need the assessment process. IPBES, IPCC, GEO, and GBO, amongst others. And what we need in these international assessment processes a more explicit mention of the uh, natural resource principles. Um, all of these assessments, whether it be it, all four of them, they talk about natural resources, but none of them explicitly talk about the four principles. We need to encourage these assessment processes to actually look at the four principles and address them explicitly, not just implicitly. Uh, IPBES has got two major assessments coming up. They've just started. One is the Nexus assessment, incredibly central to natural resources. It will look at the interactions of climate change, biodiversity, with food, water, energy, 
and health, both environmental health and human health. Embedded in that must be the uh, principles. They're only just starting to plan exactly to write this nexus assessment. We need to work with the key uh, authors to make sure that the issues of natural resources are explicitly And then there's also an assessment on transformative change, which is highly relevant. Clearly, governments, we need to work with governments at the national, sub-national level. But obviously, the best way to work with governments on this is through the CBD, UNFCC, CCD, and the other environmentally related uh, uh, conventions. So we need to make sure that these principles are embedded not just in CBD, but in the climate negotiations, the desertification uh, uh, negotiations. We need to make sure all of the international organizations, the UN organizations, UNF, U, UNIT, UNDP, FAO, EFAD, and others, all the governments embrace and start to use these principles in their day-to-day -day activities. We need both the conventions and we need the UN organizations. Business and finance, absolutely critical. Clearly, the place I would start is the Economic Forum and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. The World Economic Forum every year comes up with a risk register and they come up with a important risk. Well, number one this year was a disorderly climate action. In other words, they're worried that we won't act fast enough. So climate action. Second was extreme weather. Third was biodiversity loss. And number eight was resources. So clearly the World Economic Forum has started to understand the importance of climate, biodiversity, natural resources. And the key is how these issues all play together. Climate change, life, biodiversity, loss, land degradation, simply environmental issues, the economic issues, social issues, development issues, moral and ethical issues, and they all interact with each other. Um, it's quite clear <clears throat> that we can work with the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. They have thematic groups on climate change, biodiversity, and so we need to work with the leaders of the World Business Council again to make sure that we can embed these four principles into their work, into the implementation of their activities. We need to go beyond business to the finance community. The World Bank, the regional banks, and banks everywhere play an absolutely critical role to stop funding unsustainable practices and funding sustainable practices. Indeed, the World Bank has been working on inclusive wealth, the wealth of nations, for the last two or three decades. But we need to embed it more in decision making of banks, of governments quite often, and of course, the private sector itself. We need to work with the international aid agencies, parts of government. They can play an absolutely critical role in making sure these principles embedded and of course, there's the pension funds, the insurance companies. They all work together. We need to work with, talk about these principles, show how these principles will lead to much more state financing for the pension funds and for the insurance companies. Obviously, the public, they need to understand these issues. So we need to use the social media, we need to use the classical media, of television, radio, and newspapers. Media can play a very critical role. So we need, again, to explain these issues uh, to the uh, AP wire, to Reuters, etc. Make sure that these inf this information gets to the public. What role can it take in basically saving energy, saving biodiversity, saving water, uh, saving energy? So we need the public to get fully involved to make sure they vote for politicians uh, that actually understand these issues, that they actually buy goods and services from companies that also are sustainable. And of all, indigenous people, local community, unbelievably important. They understand 
natural resource management. They've been doing it for the second centuries, millennia, basically. But we need to make sure we use their knowledge in concert with what I would call Western knowledge in the way we actually move forward. Natural resource management, infrastructure areas, etc. So there's no question that we can, we can identify who all of the stakeholders are. What are the specific roles of the scientific community, governments, business, finance, in each of the four principles? And I think we need just a small document that actually outlines how each of the stakeholders Thanks, can Bob. indeed play their role. And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. I know you've said a lot and you're absolutely right. My takeaway is, as you've said, we know what to do. We know who to target, the banks, indigenous community, etc. My question, not to you, but to all of us, is why have we not done that? We know what to do, but we haven't done it. Um, Yanis, Isabella, anybody want to come back? on some of the issues that Joyti mentioned um, and Bob mentioned. Yanis, I'll give to you, and then I'm going to turn to Rebecca to look at the questions coming from the chat. Yanis? Thank you. And uh, not a lot to add. Um, maybe trying to address also one of the questions which uh, emerged in the chat, if you would allow me, uh, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. but, um, but first, uh, just the comment on everything what Bob has actually said. said. And uh, the message which came from his side, and we are also trying to reiterate it frequently, is that if you are addressing with these standards which we are trying to set, if we are addressing the things at the natural resource management level, the core drivers, we are basically addressing not only biodiversity, but we are addressing all issues which are covered under different kind of international governance together, which is first, extremely efficient, and second, which is a great sign of hope that these things, if done in the right way, can be dealt with. So you asked at the end why why we have not done it. I, if you would give me one hour, I would explain that in detail, but I don't have it. But there are many reasons which are existing and uh, majority goes very deep to the interest, to lock-ins, to the, to the simply the ways how we have organized ourselves, not understanding that while we are uh, while we are rationally behaving on the short term and maximizing our profits, that we are actually causing huge long-term side effects, which we are now already seeing very clearly, and that we have to align the short-term behavior and interest with the longer-term behavior and interests. Otherwise, we will simply hit the wall, which we already see that we are somehow hitting. And I sincerely believe, as you said it, Marilyn, that Bob will remain uh, returning back uh, as long as his health will allow, because his wisdom and also experience with everything uh, is so extremely valuable and, and useful and also uh, uh, used, practically useful. That's what I mean, that I really appreciate that he has joined his voice to, to today's um, efforts. Uh, Jeanette is actually asking about uh, ecosystems accounting, uh, the, how, how we could go beyond GDP and how this could be cost effective way, uh, how, how this could be done that uh, in particular for, for uh, low income countries because they are very rich, um, uh, many of them are very rich with biodiversity and this for them it's the matter of, of future perspective of quality of life, as well as their major driver also for uh, uh, not only uh, not only uh, their well-being, but also 
for them being uh, interesting for the rest of the work very much. So protected environment, I think will be one of the, of the major values of the future world. And I think for them, that's really important. So ecosystem, that, that's exactly what we tried to point in these uh, initiatives, which we, are, which, we are, which we are doing in the IRP. So agreeing about standards, agreeing about methodology, agreeing about the needed data, also how to cost effectively collect it, it's name of the game. Because if we want really to align those things and to really start seriously implementing them, without that, if everybody will do by its own way, I think we will <coughs> simply not get the results. And the final point, as uh, uh, some of you know, um, in the IRP, we are currently in intense preparation of the global resource outlook, which hopefully will be released in 23. And uh, we are shifting there from the logic of gross domestic product to the well being logic. Indeed, we don't want to talk about the methodology of well being, but rather about well being indicators about the areas which are resource intensive because they really matter at the end, how we handle them, how we manage them for the climate change, for biodiversity loss, for, uh, for the pollution. And we are also very much shifting from the logic of maximizing output of the sectors, which is prevailing today, to the logic of maximizing uh, human needs, uh, to maximizing uh, the parts which really matter uh, and I think it's it's uh, really important that we start thinking in that way because that allows us that we don't talk about how to actually clean the car, but how to position the car in the future mobility system, taking it mm. in, uh, into account how you design the city, how you basically reorganize your mobility in the city and also in the surrounding, how you organize the whole transport systems and inside that, of course, green car has an important role to play. But if, mm. you, if, you, if we don't, uh, if you don't start looking to those questions through the systems connections and through reorganizing the ways how we deliver this for the human needs, uh, we will fall short about the effective answers. No, completely understood. And the reason why I pushed Bob a little bit Yanis, and you know me, is remember we're trying to find a way to make action. You know, we, we're very good as the RP at diagnosing <laughs> the, the patient or the problem. And now we want to support the secretariat, Joy D, if she's still online, to see how the, how we can help them to actually action this agenda, if that makes sense. So I wasn't, I, I, I Bob, I was not disrespectful of you. Um, May I add a comment? A political absolutely. One? Are you going to give us some it action? Does. Give us action. No diagnosis. Yes. No, we know the problem. Not. <laughs> I fully I full agree about action and implementation. And indeed, I think that uh, when you go, I, I raised a, a question in the chat about small farmer. But I think that the politically, what you have here is the indeed that we need to move from green wishing. Okay, action means this. Okay, this is, and also how the big challenge that uh, the nature cries imposed to us is not to be on a global player, but indeed the planetary ones. It's a new dimension of how we go into action and implementation and how indeed we can use as the, our priest was, as Bob who highlighted, it's not only for biodiversity, but for the global problems or or environmental problems like climate change, indeed, how we can should bring people together uh, in tangible uh, perspectives. People, people must understand how to engage 
and how to be co-responsible to address concrete solutions. They want to act. In my country, they want to act, but they don't, they don't know how to act, okay? And they need a better governance to connect the dots. So I think that science and policy interface indeed will come with, a, and I hope, an innovative way to move from green wishing and to become green if you want to, uh, to bring this perspective. That's what I think, Bob, the influencers, many the young people, they are so powerful uh, mm -hmm. when they come to address concrete solutions and mm -hmm. act committed with, with our principles, with our, our wish. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Back to you. Absolutely. <laughs> and for those of you who are following Yunea, you may know that today in Nairobi, there's a side event. I think it's six o'clock Nairobi time where they're talking about the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. So basically, what should we be doing as citizens, as responsible people to protect the Earth's biodiversity? And so this particular conversation is happening in real time, which is good. For those of you who are following the CBD and also UNEA, I would encourage you to watch that particular conversation. Um, but let me quickly check with you, Rebecca. Are there any questions for any of our speakers today? Thank you, Merlin. We have got a question from Eva mm -hmm. um, in the chat on governance. The question is, how do you see the connections between the UN system national governments, specific natural resource extracting and managing countries, banks and other financial institutions, cities and citizens, how can they be governed effectively and should the role division be considered anew? Oh, big, big governance question. Yanis, I'm just pointing to you. I think, uh, uh... I think Bob would be better because he was actually very, very clearly explaining already that many of the things which we are listing in, in our proposals and contributions and we, which we have shared today with you needs to be exactly put into the context of who should do what and mm -hmm. identify in a kind of, and this is also uh, on his proposal, we are actually trying to do that, that put into the boxes and try to point also who would be the best actor to to start addressing that and that problems uh, and how the things uh, should be best done. But it is clear that, uh, as Eva knows very well, that this is Sisyph work. So it's repetition, 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 and uh, connecting uh, things, dots, uh, uh, getting <clears throat> the people to understand and get them on your side and that they become a kind of uh, messengers of the same message uh, which is then pushed mm. all across the board, and then when you but, find, but Janice, when you get why, this critical why message, why is governance better. such a tricky issue? Because governance, you know, just to get the jargon out of the way, as you know, is basically people say, "Don't tell me what to do <laughs> within my <laughs> jurisdiction." Um, why? Is, why uh, do you think it's so difficult because when it, it comes it, to these issues? Uh, Bob will Obviously, I know the answer. I can hear Bob is interrupting yeah, me already. Yeah, but I think it's uh, let me just quickly finish. I yeah. think it's important because otherwise we, you know, we talk in abstract mm -hmm. concepts. So it's, you know, governance is you have jurisdictions, you make rules, this is what you can do, this is what you can't, this is how things work. And so why is that so difficult? in this particular environment? Yes, it's very, <clears throat> very simple. Most individuals, most most private sector work on self-interest. And I think what's different now today 
than say 10 years ago is I think the business community, the finance community and most governments are now starting to recognize it's in self interest to become sustainable. Uh, I think the fact that the World Economic Forum, world leaders in business and in government are starting to say risk is the biggest risk we face. Loss of biodiversity is risk. They put a superb paper out last year, Nature at Risk. So the fact that world leaders in simultaneously in both government, private and financial organizations all rec starting to recognize it's in their self-interest to become sustainable, it gives me some level of optimism. Mm. So what we do is what can individual entities, different stakeholders do, and what nation of stakeholders, each one of the issues, whether it's value in nature, within value of nature, there is a role for the academic community, a role for government to put legislation, a role for the private sector, equally planning together. You need mm. together civil society, with business, with our local government as well as national government for overall regulations. So what we need to do is to work through the four principles. What's the role individuals and how do they have to work together? We have indeed had too many vested interests using cheap fossil fuels and we've still got them. We still have to address the vested interests who like subsidies on the agriculture, forestry, mining and fishery. So we've got to address diverse economic incentives at the moment. We have to address how can you complement, you're not going to replace GDP in a short term, but how do you complement the use of GDP with inclusive wealth and natural capital? And so I see we have a window of opportunity through the SDGs and which are all interrelated to each other, to work with a multitude of actors simultaneously. So we need world leaders in the business community, world leaders in the government, world leaders in the NGO. So we need leaders, basically, who can show that sustainability is economically, socially, and environmentally the best way to move forward. Correct. And... I mean, this is a complete aside, Bob, uh, but I was on a call earlier today um, where we had a conversation about what's happening um, in Ukraine and people were talking about, you know, the global financial system and the, I don't know what the word is, sanctions that they imposing on certain banks and so that's also interesting but that's a complete aside Yanis over to you and then I'm going to give Isabella the last word unless Rebecca there are some questions Yanis thank you Merlin actually what I wanted to say uh, was short answer to what you asked why we have why we are where we are, because humans are strange and complicated and the whole history of humanity is actually the best proof that we are rational, even if in the short term we behave quite rationally. And uh, what is the real problem? The real problem is that, that um, the signals which we are sending currently to producers and consumers on the markets are such that uh, that basically we, we don't value nature. And this was clearly said before. And market economy is here to stay. So we are actually behaving rationally, but this rationality is for us here and now. But if you look at it from a bit more perspective, is this rational from a longer term perspective? Is it rational for from the future generation's perspective? Is it rational from the rest of nature perspective? It's irrational, absolutely irrational. But what is the problem? We got used to benefit from this short-term irrationality. And that's why many of the people simply don't want to give up. And 
that is that is the whole difficulty of the process. So then you get a lot of interests, a lot of lock-ins, a lot of structures, which unfortunately are not allowing us to change as quick and as necessary as we would need to. And that's why I firmly believe that the work on which we are focusing, going back to the drivers, asking already still today quite difficult questions, which are not many times on the table of our colleagues also, for example, in the climate talks, who is causing the overconsumption? How can we actually help all those working from the supply side that through the overconsumption side, they would get support and better answers which would be solid and stable there? That's actually our task. And as you can see today, if you address all the problems only from the supply side, all the plans for energy transition in one night changed entirely. So it's really important that we we start looking to all those things, how and in what way can we use in the first place less energy and less natural resources for delivering provisions which human needs. And human needs are clear, we have to deliver them, but if we don't ask ourselves the question, how can we improve that delivery? How can we best do it not to create trade-offs, not to create long-term side effects? We will have the problem and we have to start asking difficult questions which are connected with reorganizing the economics. Good. So just to wrap up, Rebecca, are there any questions in the chat box? Yes, we do have a couple more questions in the Fantastic. chat. Fantastic. Um, we've got a question from Harold on um, climate change and biodiversity. Climate change will have a great impact on biodiversity. It will change the ecological composition in many aspects. How are we going to respond to these challenges as biodiversity in 50 years won't be the same as the biodiversity of today? And we've got another question um, from Rachel on what advice you would give to everyday people and local people about identifying and differentiating companies participating in greenwashing versus those companies which are taking actual action? And what are some of the me measures that we should be looking out for? Very good question. So to start with Rachel's question, she's basically saying, how do we tell everyday people who can you trust? Who are the greenwashers and who are the real folks? Bob, please give Rachel some advice. The art question to answer. Um, I think more and more uh, the NGOs are trying to evaluate which companies are indeed genuinely trying to be sustainable. Companies like Unilever have a good track record compared to others. So one almost has to look to see what they're actually doing. Are they moving away from fossil fuel or is it just rhetoric? Where are they investing their money? Um, are they using uh, certified standards to show that things that they uh, are producing meet such standards? So I don't have a very good answer to it, to be quite candid, but it is indeed the right question. And indeed, we actually need people to be carefully analysing and differentiating what is a company saying? At the moment, both from the private sector and from governments saying this is what we plan to do, but actually it's not being done. Uh, Yanis might actually or is a better, a better answer, but it is the right question. Are companies doing Certi so it's a forest company or an agri, are they using certified processes? So it gets really quite back to number one, know the true impact. So we yeah. need to effectively, both business and for governments, answer question number one, what are these harmonized international standards that companies and governments can be judged against? Mm. No, thanks for that. 
Um, Isabella, advice no, no. for, I think this is an extremely important question for, um, I think Rachel called it everyday people. Like, you know, yes. basically, how do we know who's the, who's the good, <laughs> who's the good woman and who's the bad woman? In most oh. cases, it's the it's it's the it's the guys, right? <laughs> you know, you know that you have uh, to consider the online and offline world, okay, to answer this question. The first one, we need to understand that to have a new world emerging, okay? and uh, this is a new process. What I understand from this debate, when, for example, we bring value chain and approach exactly to decouple all the impacts and to know more about allow the resource, natural resource efficient and management, we are looking forward to transparency and also co-responsibilities, not only for producers, but also for consumers. So I think that when it's absolutely important to change our behavior, how indeed we want to be engaged and what are the requirements to be committed. This is one point that uh, we should observe immediately when you go in, in the in developing economies or developing societies and uh, emerging economies. I have a question here about livestock and beef. Look, in my country, we are one of the most important beef producers in the world. 75% of this beef, of this meat, they, they are conserved Concerned in Brazil, not the international by the international community, the international market. So it's absolutely critical, in my opinion, that Brazilians that love too much barbecue, that we want that to have uh, beef without deforestation, for example. So this is how we we'll go into the the behavior of the middle class or the poorer peoples to make clear that do need to change, you share data and information and all the condition to have a transformative behavior based, for example, in value chain and be sure that we can reduce uh, and avoid impact of livestock, but also can have choice about vegetarian uh, uh, food styles, for example. So we have a new process coming, it's very important to observe this. You need to understand how use, how the use sees, this, uh, looks at science, okay, today, because if you want to be well succeed in the future, my personal experience make clear that we need to put our coins and bring young people closer to us today. There is no time to buy. So I think that you need to bring the future to the present and understand, for example, in the case of biodiversity, that you have also in climate change 1.1 Celsius degrees that the temperature raised. So the conditions that we want to operate today is not the same that was in the past. I'm sorry, mm. but we have an impact world and we need to manage based on this reality. So this is a process a new arrangements, my last comment, Marilyn, considered mm -hmm. governance will emerge. It's not only the multilateral uh, 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 governance system that we're looking for to improve for the next 50 years. We need to understand the regional uh, arrangements. We need to understand how the emerging economies will come, for example, the Green Global South. We need to understand the new dynamics for international cooperation for the West and the recent mm. world and how we did we will bring this country, this society together. It's fascinating, in my opinion, and I think that RP have really a huge contribution to bring people together and to come in this transformative world. Mm. I hope it's a better world in the future. Back to you. Good. Um, we are actually on time, 4.30. Rebecca, anybody else before we close? I mean, I, I think we are at time now. There, there is a question um, from Cindy on, on food systems mm -hmm. um, about um, knowledge gaps and um, any kind of areas um, within 
policy making where we know less than others in terms of impact but i don't know if we have time to um actually get into that seeing as we're we're out of time that's actually a good question that we can make a note so just to summarize and i want to thank rebecca i want to thank um our irp secretariat colleagues i know for organizing this thanks yanis thank you so much bob and thank you, Isabella, as always, you all go beyond the call of duty, which is a cliche, I know. Um, but working backwards, I think as the RP, as a science policy body, we are completely committed to this biodiversity agenda. We know that in April slash May, apparently, the second part of the CBD will take place. We take it seriously enough to the extent that Yanis, Mazeltov, and Isabella did this piece where they outlaid principles that they thought would be helpful to inform the CBD agenda. Um, we also are trying to send signals, and Yanis, you said, um, we need to start making sure that people understand why um, the, we don't value biodiversity as much or the market doesn't. I think that's what you said. Um, I think, Bob, you said business leaders are starting to realize that they need to become more sustainable. We obviously know that some people will say, oh, yeah, you're just greenwashing, but that's okay. Um, we've spoken a lot about governance, and that's a very key issue because that comes down to um, politics. Um, Joyti is not with us right now, um, but my last summary from Joyti is that she said that from her perspective as part of the CBD secretariat, um, they're focusing on building a monitoring framework and that's not easy to do. And we spoke a little bit about, you know, the unease about people because monitoring means you have to set targets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then Joyti also mentioned, how do we go beyond GDP? And Yanis, you also mentioned that. That's very big picture. Not sure it's gonna happen in 2020 May at the upcoming, um, CBD conference, but all of which is to say, I think this is a, a good start um, in 2022 for the RP. And I just want to give over to our coaches to say thank you to all of you. So, Yanis, over to you, and then Isabella. No, nothing to add. I think, Marilyn, you have uh, summarized well, nicely everything. I would just like to thank you, everybody. If you have any concrete proposals, please do contact us on all the questions which we have addressed today, because the whole intention of everything, what we try to do, it's to make a real change. Without that, we will not move ahead. And with uh, Isabella, we were pretty much very closely connected to the uh, to the Nagoya and to Aichi targets and everything there. And uh, seeing that after a decade, one wonders why the things didn't really change more than they they should, and uh, why we were ten years ago so happy with the conclusions. Yes. Uh, I fully agree, Yanis. Uh, thank you very much, Marilyn. I only want to add a final observation. I really didn't mention uh, greenwashing. I I try to provoke you uh, to mention greenwashing. 
It's green wishing. We need, we need to. From, this is a new moment in the world. It's not green washing. It's not a Brazilian uh, speaking about Brazil green washing. I know a lot about this. But what is critical today is how we can move from and beyond green wishing. This is a new political understanding that's coming today. So I think that we are full aligned when we're discussing this think piece and our ambition uh, to, to have implementation. Uh, 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 based on science, so using science as mentioned here before. So thank you very much. Back to you. Happy Carnival, because today is Carnival in Brazil, okay? It's a holiday. And uh, relax. We will do better. <laughs> I'm convinced of this. We did not know that. But final words. Is there a Carnival in the UK right now? <laughs> Bob's not with us. Anyway, so thank you everybody and thank you to our co-chairs and thank you, Bob, if you're still online. Thanks a lot. We'll be in touch. Bye.